Helix stock cabs are terrible. They're the worst thing ever. If you want to use your Helix and make it sound good, you have to use impulse responses. A lot of folks who watch my channel know very well those are not actually my feelings, but it is one of the things we read on the internet over and over and over again. Now, let me say one thing before I keep going at the beginning of the video so everybody that's gonna watch this video hears it. I have nothing against impulse responses. I think a lot of folks who know that I gravitate towards using stock cabs a lot in all of my presets, think that that means I dislike impulse responses, I don't like the companies who make impulse responses, et cetera, et cetera, and that nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, when you come down to it, ultimately the Helix dog cabs are a form of impulse response, just with some extra bells and whistles. So I have nothing against them. And there are some really amazing companies out there making IRs. And if those are working for you, then I say keep using them. Please keep using them and supporting these wonderful companies. I really don't have anything against them. In fact, I really enjoy the fact that there's so many great companies making so many great IRs that can be so useful. So some folks say, well, then why, if you say that, do you not use IRs in your presets? Because it, you know, it makes them sound so much better. Well, there's a simple reason for it, and I've talked about it before, and that is for workflow reasons and for the ability to be able to share presets with other Helix users or Helix native users, HX Stomp users, PodGo users, whatever it might be, where everything's right in the box and they don't have to worry about assigning a slot and making sure it's assigned properly and then scratching their head why this doesn't sound right. If it's using just the stock cabs, everything's going to work. So for my own workflow reasons as well, I find it very unruly, I guess I could say, opening up a folder with endless IRs that I have to drag in and then kind of go through, is that the one I want? Oh, let's try this one. Oh, maybe that one's better. And then, you know, our audible memory is very short when we're sh shifting through things like that and we can get ear fatigue very quickly. Whereas I find using the Helix stock cabs, I pull up a stock cab, and especially now that I'm very familiar intimately with how they sound and what I can do with different microphones and distances, I find I can just work much quicker. Now that's just me. I'm not saying that everybody else should work this way or that I'm somehow right or wrong. Everybody needs to find their way of working and do what works best for them to get them their end result and allows them the best workflow and to, to get their results as quickly as possible, if that makes any sense. So I just wanted to get that out of the way because that's not what this video is about. But I did want to clear up some possible myths that are floating around that, you know, it's just impossible with the Helix to sound good with stock cabs. And I think more and more people that go through and start using stock cabs realize that this is true. And a lot of folks that have watched my videos have contacted me and said, you know what, I was always an impulse response person. But once I watch some of your videos and some of the ways that we can use the stock cabs, I'm just over to stock cabs now. And almost always they say it's so much nicer and easier to work this way. So an impulse response is basically doing this. It's capturing a snapshot in time of a particular guitar speaker cabinet, speaker, microphone, recording chain, including the mic preamp. And it's capturing that so that we can apply that response to our Helix amps in lieu of using one of the stock cabs in this particular instance. Well, what does an impulse response not do? An impulse response is a linear process. What does that mean? Well, that means that it's not going to respond to things such as the amount of input that's put into it or how hard or soft we pick. So it's not going to act like a tube in a guitar amp or a compressor. It's not going to add more distortion as we hit it with more signal. Now the fine folks at Celestion recently released their DSRs, their dynamic responses, which do actually change depending on the input signal volume that they're fed. So your pick attack actually changes to a small degree how that speaker response is going to react, but that's a different story. I did a video about that recently, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a static impulse response where if I hit the strings hard or soft, you know, maybe my guitar amp model is changing the amount of distortion and acting in a non-linear fashion but the impulse response is simply acting in a linear response. It's not gonna act like a compressor, which when I hit harder, it squishes more. It's not gonna have sag to it, right? It's not gonna have any of these sort of non-linear responses. So it's basically just a snapshot in time. They're also very short, so we're not going to get room ambience on an impulse response either. It is going to pick up things like comb filtering in a, in a room where we've mic'd the amp, where reflections off of the boundaries, the floor, the wall, the ceilings will interact with one another and cause certain frequency cancellations and whatnot, which will 
be imparted into the impulse response. So, you know, properly miking a guitar cabinet in a decent room to make an impulse response is very important. But ultimately, that's going to become the sonic signature of this static impulse response. So when some folks seem to think that there's some magic behind this impulse response, that by putting that in a preset, it magically makes everything better and so much better than the stock cabs, that's where I start to question. I go, not really. And today, I wanted to do a little experiment, show you some examples, and then do a little blind test later on to see if you can pick out which file is which. And I'll explain that a little bit more later, but stay tuned for a blind test, which I find are really fun and so many people say they enjoy it. I'm also gonna show you how you can use some of the tools in the Helix to possibly mimic what an impulse response is giving you by just using a stock cab. So without further ado, let's go over to Cubase and take a look at what I've got going on here. All right, so you might ask what I have happening here. Well, what I did is I recorded a DI'd guitar track with my Vigier Expert Strat style guitar. Absolutely love that guitar. I almost can't put it down. I've just gravitated much more towards playing Strat style guitars lately with the three single coil pickups. Just loving it. I'm working on a really cool track that's coming out soon too with it. Uh, but anyways, I, sorry, I got off, off topic there. So I have basically, I've recorded a DI guitar track through my IK Multimedia Axe IO, just straight dry guitar DI, no tweaking or processing with the available functions on the Axe IO. And I triplicated that. Is that a word, triplicated? Anyways, I made three copies of that. And I have applied Helix Native, as you can see, here's my inserts, to all of these same identical tracks. So if I just bypass this, so nobody accuses me of any tomfoolery. And I play this. I have the identical track working. Okay, so what I did is I threw a copy of Helix Native on each one. But what I did is I pulled up the RevGen Purple Amp model. And if you notice, here are the settings I just duplicated those exact settings on each instance of Helix Native, as you can see here. So all identical settings. But what I did do is on the first instance that's labeled Helix Stock Cab is I used the 412 Greenback 25, the 121 ribbon, four inches back. No low cuts and high cuts on it. For the next version, I used the same amp model, but this time I utilized an own hammer 412 Marshall cabinet, which I really like this IR. I've adjusted the volume so these are perfectly volume matched because we always have to do that when comparing sounds. And then on the last one, I thought I would throw a real wrench into things and I would throw probably one of the most inappropriate cabinets onto this guitar amp, which is uh, own hammer Fender 112 Deluxe Reverb cabinet <laughs> impulse response, which would not be my go-to choice, but I wanted to throw something in there that was really out there that's going to just kind of prove my point here. Now let's listen to these three. What I'm going to do is loop. What you're gonna hear first is the Helix Stock Cab, then I'm going to, when you see me solo the second track, the Own Hammer 412, and then you'll see me solo the final one, which is the Own Hammer Fender Deluxe Reverb 112, okay? And we can get to hear these three, so here we go. All right, so what'd you guys think? Obviously extremely different. Let's go through and I'm going to loop these now in a way that we can hear them kind of more back to back. Again, watch for as I solo these.
So I don't think anybody's going to argue that they sound even close to the same. Now, I'm not going to say which one's better. I can give my personal opinion about this, but I don't think there is a better. These are not in any particular context. Maybe one of these would work really good in one mix. Maybe another one would work better in another mix. Then personal preference comes into it. So this is not the point. They just, they sound different. Some folks may listen to that and just because of confirmation bias go, the Helix Stock Cab sounds terrible and the Ownhammer 412 sounds amazing. Uh, this happens a lot, right? That's why the blind tests are so good. When you don't know what you're listening to, then you're not going to be swayed by knowing what it is you're listening to and choosing solely based off of this confirmation bias. So I could personally say that just in this context, the Ownhammer 112 is not my favorite tone. Uh, the Helix Dog Cab and the Ownhammer 412 are different, but I wouldn't say one is better or worse. But here was my point behind this. Can we just, using EQ, make these sound almost indistinguishable? Now, a lot of folks might instantly say, no way, like that Ownhammer 112 Fender is way too different, and that's going to impart that Fender sonic signature to that sound, which may not be what we want or whatever. But what I have here is an interesting plugin that comes with Isotope's Ozone Mastering Software, and this is called Match EQ. So what I did, and you'll notice here, we can get a reference sound that we can capture. So as not to have bored you all with watching me do this, what I did is I took the Ownhammer 412 as the reference. The reason I used the Ownhammer as the reference is so many folks say the IRs are better than the stock cab. So I thought, well, let's see if we can get the stock cab to sound like the IR with nothing but EQ. Instead of sitting there and tweaking myself, I just thought, let's use a match EQ plugin. So I captured the reference off of the Ownhammer 412. I then transferred the plugin over to this track and I captured the Helix Stock Cab, which I wanted to apply that reference to. I did that. I then took the amount of EQ and I put it to a point where I thought it kind of sounded pretty darn close. Took the smoothing out so we get all our peaks and valleys and see how close the match EQ could come to matching that. And I did the same thing utilizing the Match EQ plugin on the Deluxe Reverb 112 IR as well. And I captured the Ownhammer 412 and I basically EQ'd it. And you'll notice the EQ curves on both of these Match EQs are quite different. The Deluxe needed a big boost in the low end, whereas the Helix Stock Cab needed a cut in the low end. Uh, look at this huge dip here around maybe 4,500 hertz, 5,000 hertz, whereas over here we had a big boost around that same level. So very dramatic, drastic EQ that was applied. Um, but here's what happens now when we do this. I've now put the EQ on both of these. What I want to do first is I'm going to play the Helix Stock Cab with the Match EQ off, and then as we're listening, I'll turn it on. You can hear the difference. Okay, now let's do the same thing, but with the Ownhammer 112. We'll start with it off, and this one's going to be quite a dramatic change. Let's listen to that. Pretty amazing how it fattens it up. Now, let's keep this engaged. And let's flip back and forth between all three of these sounds as we loop it now. I was actually really quite shocked at how incredibly close these now sound. Like, almost to the point of, I would say, being indistinguishable. Let's take a listen and you can give me your thoughts on that.
Okay, now what I would suggest you do too is go back and listen to that section again in the video, but close your eyes and don't watch where I'm switching and then see if you still hear any difference. Because I know myself, I've been fooled before that when you can see when the switch is happening, all of a sudden you go, oh, there, yes, yes, there's a difference, there's a difference. But do it without watching where the switches are. And I think you'll find that, and I'm not saying that these are identical, uh, but wow, going from what we had, especially with, let's say, the 112 versus the 412 own hammer. It's really amazing how close that that EQ came to matching the tones of these up. And honestly, in a mix, I don't really know if we would even notice a difference between any of those. So what's my point? Well, the point is that there is no real magic in an impulse response. It's imparting its sonic character onto the sound, period. Can that pretty much be accomplished with EQ? I tend to say, yes, it can. So what tools do we have in the Helix? Well, we've got lots of tools. We've got parametric EQs, graphic EQs, high and low shelf EQs, et cetera, et cetera to be able to tweak this. We also have the ability to put different microphones. You want something thinner, put an SM57, an MD421. You want something thicker, put the Coles 4038, put the R121. Move the distance back and forth further to get more bottom, less bottom, change the, the sound of that. So we have tons of tools that once we learn how to use them right within the Helix, we can probably accomplish either the same thing as one of our favorite IRs. Maybe one is really fat. Good, well you can cue that in with a certain type of EQ or possibly a microphone change. You know, so I guess my point is you can very likely just create in the Helix whatever any impulse response sounds like. Now, having said that, a lot of folks, I know what they're gonna say. Well, I don't wanna have to tweak EQ and I don't wanna have to do all that work. If I can just drop an IR in there and have it work right away, then that's what I'm gonna do. And I agree 100%. I would never argue with somebody who wants to do that as long as they can also admit at the same time that the Helix thought cabs are capable of that. They just don't want to go or don't know how to go about getting it out of them. And that's fine, but is it any less work for somebody who doesn't already have an IR chosen to go and sift through 50, 60, 70, 100, 150 IRs to get to a point where they go, oh, I think this one works, only later to decide it doesn't, when with a few tools within the Helix, we could kind of accomplish the same thing. And that's where I'm coming from. But absolutely, if you have an impulse response you know and you love and it works on everything, by all means, put it in. There's your workflow. That's what's going to work best for you. And I would encourage that as long as you at the same time can admit that that very same thing is probably very possible to accomplish within the Helix itself anyways. And the stock cabs don't suck as bad as everybody says they do. Okay, so here's for a blind test. And then after this blind test, I'm gonna come back and show you how I use some tools in the Helix to make the stock cabs work in any situation that I want. Not that I think they even sound bad just the way they are. So for this blind test, I'm going to now, now that you've heard these three files, I'm going to choose one of them, either just the Ownhammer 412 on its own or one of the others with the match EQ. And I wanna see if you can guess which one is which. I'm only gonna play you one and see if you can tell me whether that's the Helix Stock Cab with EQ, the Ownhammer 112 with EQ, or the Ownhammer 412 just as is. So we'll play that and then leave me in the comments below just your one simple guess which one of the three it actually is. Okay, so there's the file. So let me know in the comments and I'll do a reveal video later on this week with the answer to which one you were listening to. Now on over to the Helix itself. Um, what could we do with this tone? If we weren't liking what it was already. What I have here is the same preset you heard in the previous examples with the Rev Gen Purple and the Helix Stock Cab with the 412 Greenback 25. Well, one of my favorite tools, 
Uh, and a lot of folks who've been following my channel for a while will know that I did this thing called the split crossover. This is before we had low and high shelf EQs in the Helix. The low and high shelf EQs are in the Helix because of the video I did about utilizing gain blocks in the split crossover, which basically turned it into a low and high shelf EQ in a very kind of clumsy way. It's much nicer to just have this block in here. In the video I did about that, I, I compared using the low and high shelf, or in that case, a split crossover technique, to almost the ability to be able to move a microphone around on and off axis. And it really does do that. So one of the things that I like to do here is if I was to put this after the fact and take my preset that I have here. Let's take our low frequency and boost everything below the 300 Hertz it's set at 12 dB. What a lot of beef, you know? Now, a lot of folks that put an IR on, a lot of times it's a very boomy, bassy IR, and they go, yeah, listen to that, that's amazing. Once I play this, to me, that's way too much usable bass. We're gonna cut that out in the mix anyway. But the problem is now when I turn that off, my original preset sounds very thin because we've been conditioned to kind of like this. Turn it off. Now it sounds really weak and thin. So somebody goes, oh, that, uh, that, that stock cab is terrible. But is this really a usable tone? Maybe sitting in your room playing by yourself going, oh, listen to the nice fatness out of it. Well, sure. But then you're gonna realize quickly when you get it in a mix, you're gonna be rolling all that out anyways to make room for the kick drum and the bass guitar. And it's not gonna really work as nicely as it sounds there. Now, taking something like that and maybe only adding a few dB of it might work better. Find a lot of times with the high and low shelf EQ, a little goes a long way. Um, maybe we want to change the frequency up to, you know, maybe uh, an area that I really enjoy, which is around 650 hertz. Mm. So if you like a little more fullness and beef, that's one thing you can do. You can use that in combination with a low cut up to around 110 to really control the low, low bottom, but to get some nice beef in there. <laughs> Or maybe we need to actually thin that out even more to have it fit in a dense mix, you know? So we've got that. Maybe there's something that is too bright. We can just sit with the high frequency setting at three kilohertz, drop that down by a couple dB. Or maybe we need some more sizzle. 
A lot of folks know my favorite settings on these a lot of times are setting both of these to 650 and then just tweaking small amounts. <laughs> So there's a lot of power in simply the low and high shelf EQ to really add or subtract things we want from a stock cab very quickly, very effortlessly, and with a little bit of practice, it can be a really, really useful tool to maybe bypass the IRs and just get what we need right out of the unit itself. Plus, we also have the parametric EQ, graphic EQ, which can also be used. I'm not going to go into detail on those. I've done many other videos on that, but I wanted to just throw that out there. So, for today, go let me know what you thought you listened to in the blind test. Was it the Helix with the stock cabs with the match EQ? Was it the Ownhammer 412 IR? Or was it the Ownhammer 112 Fender Deluxe Reverb IR? Tell me which one you thought you heard there and then I'll give the results in a few days. I hope you guys found that video useful. I think it's a really important topic to reiterate and revisit because I still see online so many folks that just keep going on about how horrible the Helix stock cabs are. And, you know, it becomes this really contentious issue among some folks, and I don't think it needs to be. And like I said, nothing against IRs. If that's working for you, then please use it. You should. If it's, if it's the sound you're looking for and the workflow you're looking for, then you have your answer right there. As long as we can all kind of agree that, you know, I don't think the Helix Stock Cabs are quite as bad as we thought. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Stay tuned for the results of the little blind test we did today. I'll be back soon with that. Please like the video and share it with as many folks as you can so we can get a good sample size on the test. And please subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell notification to get notified when I put new content out. I'll be back really soon. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. Ciao for now.